This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening. All eyes are on the ongoing COVID-19 crisis from today's suspension of Parliament in Ottawa to here in Newfoundland and Labrador with recreation centres being closed, conferences and concerts cancelled. rather, As the number of Canadian cases continues to grow, the province's chief medical officer is again meeting with reporters tonight. Here now is Mark Quinn is standing by live at the Confederation Building. So Mark, what do we know now? Well, Anthony, some good news. Uh, no new cases in Newfoundland Labrador and still no cases in Newfoundland Labrador. There have been 62 people tested in this province. All of the tests have come back presumptive negative. Uh, more than 40 of those tests, tests have been also sent to national labs in Canada, and those have also come back negative so far, the 40 of the 62. So 62 is the total, all negative so far. Now, CBC did obtain a memo from Eastern Health, and that memo says that um, an uh, emergency operations centre has been established in Newfoundland Labrador. It also says that a COVID-19 assessment clinic is being set up at the Waterford Hospital and that's expected to be up and running by early next week. That memo also says that um, annual leave for Eastern Health employees will not be approved for the next six weeks. It says if you have had that annual leave approved, uh, that will still go ahead, but if you're looking to get it approved in the future, that will not happen for the next six weeks. Um, there is also a federal announcement that says that all cruise ships that have uh, more than 500 passengers won't be allowed to do uh, Newfoundland Labrador in Canada uh, until July 1st. So what that means for Newfoundland Labrador is that we were uh, scheduled to have three ships coming here uh, before July 1st. Uh, and now just one of those will arrive because it will have fewer than 500 passengers. Uh, other provinces have closed schools for two weeks. We asked uh, the chief medical officer if that will happen here in Newfoundland and Labrador. She said uh, not yet. Uh, she says it's too soon. We have no cases. Uh, so that's not happening here yet in Newfoundland and Labrador. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Now, while that news conference was going on, the city of St. John's held one of its own. It is closing all recreation facilities starting tonight. Mile one, the Railway Coastal Museum, the Pippi Park Winter Activity Center, as well as the Welcome Center on Water Street, all of them closed. St. John's City Council will continue to meet, but those meetings will be closed to the public and all public meetings canceled as well. City facilities will remain closed until further notice. Mayor Danny Breen says the city's after school programs will continue to operate so long as schools remain open. One of the key concerns now is uh, is transmission and uh, where the idea is to keep down social interactions and keep larger groups from uh, from congregating. And so uh, that's one of the things that we've uh, uh, that we're concerned about is is the transmission of the uh, of the virus. So uh, today uh, we had uh, several meetings uh, over the last couple of days to look at what our uh, what we're going to be doing in the future. And this afternoon we also had a, a large discussion with our uh, with our colleagues in the in the region. Well, to the west coast now, where Marble Mountain has closed its slopes for the season. The announcement was made earlier this afternoon. Here now's Troy Turner has that story from Steady Brook. Totally illogical. Why would you Why would you shut Marble Mountain first? when you have all these other places still open. The news was not exactly welcomed. Wide open air, a massive hill, and space for all the turns and edges they could carve. Many skiers and snowboarders understood the reasons, but are still disappointed. Because we're talking about an environment where people are out of doors, in a healthy environment, trying to make themselves uh, fit and, and being able to, you know, take advantage of uh, the lifestyle out here. And uh, for that to be taken away, uh, now all of a sudden, you know, a lot of people are going to be uh, left with uh, little to do at this time of the year. Right? So. The news was delivered to the skiers midday. Concerns over the COVID-19 virus led to the closure. Skiers agree safety is a priority, but the timing wasn't ideal. I can't help wondering if perhaps they could have left the, the hill open with people outside and maybe close the lodge if that might have been an option. Or at least uh, there were a number of school groups here uh, right in the middle of the day if they could have waited till perhaps the end of the day. Those are options, but then it's, it, you know, it's not my call and I understand it was a, a government decision. Marble Mountain is taking its direction from the province, but given the favorable conditions this season, this was a tough way to go out. The hill management says it feels for the skiers. Uh, with the conditions that we've had this season, it's been some of the best uh, skiing and riding we've had in the last five years. 
Uh, so to close down on a bluebird sunny day on, in theory, one of our busiest weekends of the year with St. Patrick's Day, it was something that, uh, you know, brings a tear to my eye. After the closure, a statement was issued by the Premier's office. It said non-essential gatherings or events of 250 people or more should be canceled or postponed. Troy Turner, CBC News, Steady Brook. These symptoms remain mild, but we are following medical advice and taking every precaution. Well, the Prime Minister isn't showing any signs of symptoms, but will remain at home in isolation for 14 days as a precaution. This after his wife Sophie has tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. Trudeau says he is considering advising Canadians against all non-essential travel, and he tells CBC that he aims to offer more financial support to Canadians who are affected by this crisis. My colleagues and I, in direct collaboration with our friends across the aisle, have come to an arrangement to suspend Parliament while ensuring the government continues to have the authority and capability to provide our country with necessary financial supports. And an unprecedented step today in response to the coronavirus pandemic. A motion was passed to suspend Parliament until April the 20th. It's historic. Now, it won't affect the government's ability to step up with new measures in response to the coronavirus. The budget will go ahead, but it, it has been postponed. Well, the country's top health official is strongly urging against all international travel to help stop the spread of the virus. Today, my advice is to postpone or cancel all non-essential travel outside of Canada. This means reconsidering your vacations, going to sporting and entertainment events, large international conferences. Dr. Theresa Tam also warned travelers they could potentially face further quarantine restrictions in other countries as well, and everyone coming to Canada is being asked to self-isolate for 14 days. In addition, the federal government says all international flights into Canada will be restricted to a small number of airports. Well, Mark Quinn met, uh, spoke with us live earlier. He had that update for us from the province's chief medical examiner. But she met with reporters less than an hour ago and had this to say about reports of people in the province who are stocking up on supplies. Nobody needs to run out and buy mounds of things at this point. Um, it's okay to consider buying a little bit extra when you go out, making sure that you have any essential medications that you need and that you're not, you know, you have at least a two week supply of that on hand. Uh, but, you know, we, we're not really uh, preparing for uh, severe, uh, you know, uh, restriction. Well, national and international experts are warning about a recession here at home. Local business is now bracing for the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some also bracing for a financial hit. Now, for its part, the province's tourism industry is touching base with its operators. Here now's Heather Gillis has more on that story. Tourism contributes $1.1 billion to Newfoundland and Labrador's economy and employs nearly 20,000 people in 2,700 businesses. So it's a major economic generator. So I, you know, I certainly understand the, the concern when something like this hits globally. Steve Denty is the chair of Hospitality NL. His association has formed a working group to share the latest health and safety information about COVID-19 with tourism operators. Worldwide, conferences, concerts, trade shows and sporting leagues are being cancelled. And as the spring travel season approaches, that's a concern. I think there's been some smaller ones with delegates coming from away that have, have changed their plans and shifted different timelines. Uh, again, we're staying tuned to that to see exactly what effect it's going to have. Businesses who rely on tourism aren't the only ones feeling the impact of COVID-19. Some offices in the St. John's area have told employees to work from home and small businesses often rely on products from countries hard hit by the virus. Justin Penny repairs hundreds of smartphones and tablets from his home in Paradise. Whatever we can get reliable parts for, we'll fix. He orders those parts from Shenzhen in China, and they're becoming harder for him to find. Factories, he said, were already closed for the Chinese New Year, and then the coronavirus hit, interrupting the supply chain. Now, if there's a delay in getting those parts in, there's still a demand, supply is low, so prices increase. Last time there was a shortage, Penny says prices tripled overnight, and that increase only gets passed on to the customer. We try to negate it, but uh, I haven't seen an increase yet, but we will adjust our prices accordingly. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's.
And we had all this prepared for the seniors last evening, and the city, I guess, wisely decided that they didn't want to have a gathering of seniors who were very susceptible, of course, to illness. So what do you do when you have more than 100 Jigs dinners on your hands, all of them cooked and ready to eat? We'll tell you what one local organization did to help other people. Plenty of sunshine today across most of the island, even up through parts of Labrador, but we're starting to see that cloud cover push in. We've got those cooler temperatures as well, but as we head into tomorrow through the overnight and uh, through most of the day tomorrow, this mess is headed our way. Uh, we're looking at snow, uh, blowing snow, some freezing rain possible, certainly going to see some ice pellets as well. There's a number of warnings in place already. Wind warnings along the west and south coast, including parts of eastern Newfoundland. Uh, Winter storm warnings all the way up through uh, the coast of Labrador, as well as a snowfall warning for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then we've got a blowing snow advisory as well for parts of the west and south coast. I'll tell you how much snow to expect, when to expect it when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. The town of Stephenville is handing over $100,000 to the local airport. It's an operation that has been struggling financially. In January, PAL Airlines stopped landing in Stephenville, taking away the airport's last year-round commercial air service. But Mayor Tom Rose says the town considers the airport to be a billion-dollar asset, and with the right business plan, it could survive. Rose says they are in negotiations with an airline to bring in a new service, and they've also approached a major aviation management company to work on the business analysis. Well, some people in St. John's found out today that there is such a thing as a free dinner. An organization that provides services for people with disabilities cooked up a big lunch and handed out the meals free of charge. Here now is Andrew Hawthorne explains. Carrots, potatoes, turkey and salt beef. They had everything you need for a Jigs dinner. More than 140 meals were prepared for a city event for seniors last night. But at the last minute, the dinner was cancelled. The city, I guess, wisely decided that they didn't want to have a gathering of seniors who were very susceptible, of course, to illness. So they cancelled the meal and um, told us to, to dispose of it. So we're just giving it away to people in the community. It was just one of dozens of similar gatherings cancelled in an attempt to prevent COVID-19 exposure. Okay, so the hub decided to give the meals away, a free hot lunch to keep spirits bright despite concerns over the pandemic. Oh, I got myself two Jake's dinners on behalf of the people in the hub who I would like to thank for their generosity. Excellent. And a good way to spend St. Paddy's Day. Who are you going to share these dinners with? I'm going to take this one home to my better half. Thank you very much. I'm sure she'll enjoy it too. The hub also provides meals for Daffodil Place, another centre at high risk from COVID-19 due to the effect of cancer treatment on the immune system. Badcock says that they are making alternate arrangements to prepare food to minimize possible exposure to patients. Andrew Hawthorne, CBC News, St. John's. Well, to a very different dinner now, one that has no connection to COVID-19. I'm talking about a Bonavista man's spaghetti supper. Now, here and now is Garrett Barry sat down with Dean Prince, a man who went viral before that meant something bad was happening. But it was odd on that day, it was all natural, it was just like, you know, you know, this got to be the easy way to do it, right? Scissors here, but I'm gonna try to watch you first to see exactly. Yep. We'll just pick up exactly your scissors. Okay, so your right hand is the scissors. Yep. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm right-handed though. Go with this. Pick up whatever you want to pick right, up. Right, and right. I use each. I use each a lot faster, but I'll take them okay. easy today, right? And you just snip like that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I'll do it. We got a good piece of spaghetti. One of the things that was remarkable about the video, and you just said, uh, you ate with a, a deliberate speed and, and intensity and passion, maybe. Like normally, like uh, I got it down to, like when I eat, like I used to, like just wop it down pretty quick and everything else. And that's always the way I eat ever since I was a kid. And uh, my son Jeffrey's in Alberta now. 
like when we used to have this for supper or whatever, he used to get up and say, well, I gotta sit here. And he'd take his plate and go in the room because he couldn't listen to me grunt and eat at the same time and the way I used to eat and everything else, right? When did it first come to, to your mind to eat spaghetti with scissors? Well, I was there one day, I was out, like I said, plowing snow and I was pretty busy. And my wife put it on the table and I got up to get my uh, fork and that. And when I looked, I seen the sitters there, so I got to try this stuff. <laughs> so I just started picking it up, snipping it off with the sitters and it worked. So it was how long ago? That was about three weeks. I didn't think much of it. What I do is I said, yeah, this works. And uh, then Judy looked at me and she started laughing and she said, I got to film this. She said, wait. <laughs> And then everybody started viewing it and then started getting a lot of attention and bang, right. they right. borrow. Right, and, and did you have any idea what you were getting yourself into? No, not a clue, not a clue. So what are people in by this to say? Well, I'm going for a coffee. They're talking about it there and wherever I go, and other people are saying like, time is scissor man and spaghetti man and stuff like that, right? But it was odd on that day, it was odd natural, it was just like, you know, you know, this got to be the easy way to do it, right? Instead of flicking it up, I used to have sauce. My wife used to say, Dean, you got sauce on your glasses again, right? No more of that. There's a little bit, there's, there's a few marks on my, on, on my apron, but not a whole lot. Not yet, anyway. Yeah, well, you're just a rookie. You're just starting <laughs> out, right? <laughs> the next time you have spaghetti, you're going to think about me with the sinners, right? Right, well, I, I absolutely will. I don't know. I'm not, well, what do you think of my technique first? You're doing pretty good you're for doing, the first time. Doing okay? Yep. Not too bad at all. Quite the reaction from here now, viewers, when we played an archival clip of Lorraine Michael from eight years ago. Turns out that Ms. Michael was prophetic when she raised concerns about Muskrat Falls. We'll talk to Ms. Michael in just a moment.
Well, despite all the grim news today, it's been a very busy news day. It's a mm. gorgeous, blue, bright, fantastic March day. It was right? absolutely stunning. Yeah, oh, there, there you go. Look at that shot. Live shot. Proof. Ugh. Don't you just want to be out on the Looking, water right the now? The water looks fantastic. It really does. Light, light winds, which is nice. Yeah, nice to see the sun. It sure is. Yeah. yeah. Take a look at those uh, temperatures that we saw today, or at least we saw single, minus single digit temperatures. That's where we're sitting right now. Uh, we did see the temperatures drop a few degrees. Minus three in St. John's. Similar temperatures across the island, uh, up through Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, minus six. And then Nain, you're currently sitting at minus 12. So here's a look at uh, the current situation. We're starting to see uh, some cloud cover push in up through Labrador as well as uh, the island and some flurries as well. And that's generally going to continue as we head through the night tonight. Now I added those winds again tonight just to show you and time out uh, what we're going to see wind wise. So once we see that cloud cover, which we're starting to see now, the snow will uh, start and continue through the overnight. So we're looking at winds picking up, uh, certainly in the early morning hours along the west coast, 120 kilometer per hour winds. In exposed areas that are prone to southeasterlies, you could see winds in excess of 140 kilometers per hour. And at times tonight, we're going to see things change over to or at least mix with some ice pellets, certainly along the west and south coast. And then note that pink, that's uh, some ice pellets and also the potential for some freezing rain. And uh, as far as those warnings go, this is why we have uh, those wind warnings along the west and south coast, now including uh, Bonavista and Bonavista North, as well as winter storm warnings. So areas in the winter storm warnings, you're going to see mainly snow, maybe mixed with ice pellets and then ending as some either freezing drizzle or drizzle tomorrow morning. And then we've got uh, those winter storm warnings along the coast as well. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, you're in a snowfall warning at this point. And then because of those strong winds and snow tonight, a blowing snow advisory is in effect for the west and uh, as well as Burgio through tonight. So here's your temperatures. They're going to drop uh, a little bit more. Minus five for Corner Brook. Those winds again anywhere from 80 to 140 kilometers per hour. And then by morning the winds will pick up for eastern portions of Newfoundland. Minus seven will be the overnight low in St. John. Should stay fairly nice and then we'll see that snow move in by morning. And then Labrador uh, minus 14 for Lab City. Now for tomorrow, we'll see uh, some snow mainly for eastern Newfoundland starting and then it'll quickly change over through to ice pellets and then some extended periods, possibly of freezing rain by morning and then into the afternoon, those winds are going to pick up and you're going to see everything change over to rain and that should be the majority of eastern Newfoundland. Uh, but winds are going to stay strong through the day. Eventually things will taper off and then redevelop into the afternoon along the west coast. So you will see a little bit of a break. Don't think that it's over because more snow will push through uh, into the afternoon. So as far as amounts go, this is what I'm thinking. 5 to 15 centimeters for the majority of central and the west coast. Otherwise, again, that transition from snow to ice pellets, freezing rain to rain. And then up through the big land, you're looking at anywhere from 15 to 30 centimeters with this one. Again, portions of central, you'll probably end as drizzle. And that's because temperatures are going to be up into the single digits on the plus side of the mercury. St. Anthony, you're going to hover around zero. So if you do see anything, it'll change over to maybe some freezing drizzle. And then uh, for Saturday afternoon for the big land, this is where you're going to be sitting temperature wise. But again, snow and blowing snow continuing. The winds will eventually die down a little bit for uh, Lab West. Minus seven will be your afternoon high and then temperatures along the coast looking at the minus single digits. So Saturday looks a little busy or it is going to be a little busy. But by the time we get to Sunday, those temperatures will drop. I'll have all the details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, here and now now has some excellent survival info for you right now as this pandemic continues. What exactly should any of us do if we start to feel sick? Maybe you've been asking that question. How do you actually get tested? Well, Dr. Allison McGeer is the perfect expert. She helped to lead the fight against SARS and Dr. McGeer now walks us through what we all need to know step by step. I'm Dr. Allison McGear, and I'm a microbiologist and infectious disease epidemiologist at Sinai Health System in Toronto. I'm here to talk to you about what to expect if you need to be tested for COVID-19. If you think you need to be tested, what do you do? 
Well, the first thing you want to do is check with your family doctor to sort out whether you do need to be tested or not. And you want to start that process on the telephone because if you do need to be tested for COVID-19, it's important for people to know that you might have it and to be taking the proper precautions. If you, you and your doctor decide between you that you do need to be tested, it may be that your doctor will have all the equipment to do it in the office. It's more likely that your doctor will send you to the emergency department to be tested there. There's two kinds of tests that are done. They both use the same swab, and this is what it looks like. It's a very small and quite flexible swab, and it's got a little brush on the end. And the nurse will put it into your nose, curl it up to the back of your nose, and then rotate it so that that brush brushes the cells in the back of your nose, it goes into the tube, gets sealed up, and then the tube gets sent off to the lab for the test. Does it hurt to get one of these swabs done? It doesn't hurt as much as it's uncomfortable. It's just kind of an odd sensation when somebody is putting a brush, even a very small one at the back of your nose, but it's not usually painful and it's not the least bit dangerous. The reason that it's a swab of your nose is because this virus lives in the, uh, in the lining of the back of your nose and down the back of your throat. So what happens if you test positive for COVID-19? It's important to remember that most people who get COVID-19 have mild illness. In general, the cases that we've seen in Canada have been people who've not been sick enough to need to be in the hospital. So you will get sent home with instructions on how to do self-isolation at home. Um, and you'll be in touch with your public health department who will help you if you have questions and who will arrange for testing so that you know when you no longer have the virus and you can come out of isolation and go back to your usual life. Marshall is the one who best knows who can deliver this project in a timely fashion. Liberal leadership hopeful Andrew Fury weighs in on the question, should heads roll at Nalcor?
On yesterday's show, we showed you some comments that were made in the House of Assembly eight years ago. Lorraine Michael was the leader of the NDP at the time, and the PC government was about to give final approval for the Muskrat Falls project. I hope for the sake of the people who are going to be paying much higher prices for electricity, I hope beyond hope that I'm going to be proven absolutely wrong and that by 2020, that by 2020, please goodness, somebody's going to be able to say, well, Lorraine, you know, it worked out okay. But at this moment, the questions that I have are not just my questions. They're not just the questions of the five of us who are elected in this house. They are the questions of thousands of people. Well, what Lorraine Michael had to say there resonated with many viewers with us last evening. So we decided to invite Ms. Michael to the program. Welcome back. Thank you very much. So when you, when you see that, you speaking almost a decade ago, and you think about where we are today in 2020, you want it to be wrong. What do you think of where we are? Well, where we are is, is even more frightening than it was uh, eight years ago. Uh, and I wanted to be wrong, but deep in my heart, I really knew I wasn't wrong because we hadn't been given any of the information to prove that the project was going to be sustainable, that it was going to be viable. We asked for economic analysis like the Joint Review Panel did. We asked for proof that there was going to be a market for power. Everything we asked where they didn't give us the answers. That was a sign to me and to everybody that they hadn't done the analysis because if they had the information, they would have been happy to give it to us if it mm -hmm. was good information. So I knew I was right, but I really was terrified you know, somewhere in that speech that night during the filibuster, I used the word terrified because I was. And now here we are, and the people in the province are terrified now. By what we face financially now. Yes. You were there uh, really through the whole genesis of the approval That's of this right. project, and, and here we are. You've seen uh, what Justice LeBlanc had to say. The overall narrative in his report and his findings seems to be that there, this was going to happen. Yes. There was some kind of pressure and some people took, I think, unprincipled steps to make this happen. Yes. You dealt and had a chance to question and see some of the players in action, Danny Williams, Ed Martin, Kathy Dunderdale, Jerome Kennedy, all of these people. With respect to Ed Martin, what's your sense of his role in all of this? Well, there's no doubt in my mind, I used to meet with Ed, you know, probably once a year, there'd be some of us, go, I would go as leader, would probably have our, one of our researchers with us, et cetera, and meet with him, ask questions, see where things were. And there was no doubt in my mind from my meetings with Ed that he was doing what he was told to do by his bosses. He actually used that term with me one time, doing what his bosses wanted. And there was no doubt in my mind who the bosses were. You know, Danny Williams, right up until he stepped away in, in 2010, had put all the building box blocks in place. And then Kathy just took over with Jerome to continue what they had already been part of, because they'd been part of it. And for him to say now, and for Ed to say, both Williams and Ed to say now, that, oh, it wasn't a foregone conclusion. Of course it was a foregone conclusion. Why did we spend 86 hours in filibuster? It was because there we determined it was happening, therefore nothing of what we said meant anything. And nothing of what people like Dave Vardy and Des Sullivan said meant, meant anything either, mm -hmm. because they were going to do it. And critics were ridiculed. Ridiculed. We were ridiculed in the House of Assembly. Mm -hmm. And those other people ri ridiculed outside of the House of Assembly. We were laughed at. I mean, you can go to Hansard and see. Why should I listen to you know, the opposition's the economists? Who are these economists? They don't know what they're talking about. Right. We were made fun of. One of the critical findings in, uh, in the report that everybody's pouring over, this 1,200-page mm -hmm. monster, has to do with certain key executives. And you know where I'm going with this. Yes. Um, Justice LeBlanc says uh, that they were involved in this. He, he, he questions the principal steps that they took. As you know, some people say that these executives should be terminated with cause as a result of this. There was a forensic audit, a $16 million inquiry. Mm -hmm. What do you think should happen to those executives at Nalcor who were well, identified in this report? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, anybody who knows anything about justice and, and people in, in Justice LeBron's position know that they base their, their decision making on facts. And I think he based things on facts, first of all, I want to say that. So the facts that led to his conclusion he didn't make up what's in the report about things that Gil Bennett did. It's there. It, it's in documented. Everything that he has in the report is documented. And for them to now be protected, I think, is wrong. And, and I think it is a position of our party. I know the le current leader of the NDP has said. Ms. Coffin. Yeah, yeah. Ms. Coffin has said. 
and I totally agree with her. If I was still in her position, I'd be saying the same thing. Right. That uh, you can't just go by, you know, they're doing okay for me now, which is what Stan Marshall is saying. I'm sure they probably are. But why didn't they stand up to things back then? Because if Ed was doing it because his bosses were telling him, when you can be sure they felt protected doing the things that they were doing as well. Then. Then, yeah. back then. And other bosses protecting them now. And other bosses protecting them now. So I, I think they have to be accountable not to whoever their bosses were. They have to be accountable to the people of this province. Lorraine Michael, good to see you again. Great. Good to be here. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's going to be the next liberal leader who has to decide what to do with the Muskrat Falls Inquiry report and the recommendations. And Andrew Fury is one of the people who's running for that position. What would you do with the recommendations that we've seen here from Justice LeBlanc? Uh, Peter, I think Justice LeBlanc did, a, did us a great service in providing a roadmap so that this a project like this doesn't happen again. And that would be the true tragedy for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians if we didn't learn from the mistakes. And so I'm committed to implementing the recommendations that uh, Justice LeBlanc has made. What about the individuals who were named in the report? There's been a lot of criticism about the fact that many of them are still involved on the project and some of them also still work within the senior levels of government. What do you think should happen with them? So Justice LeBlanc was clear in, in saying that Mr. Marshall uh, did a great job in changing the management style and even the corporate culture uh, in, in Nalcor. And I think Mr. Marshall is best positioned to know who is best to fill those positions right now in this crucial moment in, in this project's history. I think the primary focus needs to be getting this job complete in a timely fashion with minimizing the risk to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians so that we can maximize the value of this asset. So Mr. Marshall's best position to make those decisions at this particular moment in time. But you have someone like Gilbert Bennett who was criticized for withholding information, for pushing this project through, and yet he's still there collecting uh, hefty salary. A lot of people say, well, where's, where's the punishment? Where, is the, where are the consequences for doing this when you still get to keep your job and you still get to continue to do this? And sure, so the Justice Department, as I, as I understand it, is looking at potential civil action. But again, uh, Mr. Marshall is the one who best knows who can deliver this project in a timely fashion. That perhaps, he's, perhaps, as Mr. Marshall has said, he wasn't the best person at, in 2012. But if Mr. Marshall is committed that this is the best person today, then we need to get this project over the finish line. And Mr. Marshall is, again, best positioned to know who can do that for us so that we can maximize the value of this asset for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. But what about the people who are in the civil service? For example, Charles, Bo Charles Bowen is a deputy minister. Yep. He was criticized within that report. Would he still be a deputy minister under your government? So Mr. Bone would have to, uh, as all civil servants do, answer to the clerk of the uh, to the clerk of the council, and has presumably annual reports. And I'd look forward to seeing those uh, and discussing it with the clerk, who's the head of the public service, and seeing how Mr. Bone's performing. And thanks to uh, here now's Peter Cowan for that. Now Fury tells CBC that due to COVID concerns, he will not be campaigning in person. That means no door knocking. Well, Andrew Fury isn't the only one siding with Stan Marshall. We also heard from Dennis Brown today. The consumer advocate is charged with protecting the interests of electricity users in this province. Brown says right now it's more important to learn from the inquiry report than to purge people from NALCOR. If Mr. Marshall wants particular individuals to assist him on the project, I think it's probably in the public interest that at this juncture uh, we defer to Mr. Marshall on that subject, and I would. That would be the easy route to do, but where would it leave us? It would leave Mr. Marshall in a bind, put him under considerably more stress, and ultimately that is not in the public interest. Now, Brown would not join the war of words that's erupted in the wake of the LeBlanc report. Former NALCOR CEO Ed Martin has accused Justice Richard LeBlanc of bias. Former Premier Danny Williams says it's incomprehensible to think that politicians or bureaucrats weren't looking out for the best interests of the province. But Brown did have this to say. We all have to come together to deal with the debacle of Muskrat Falls and the costs it has inflicted on our people and the destruction it has done to our economy.
Well, we wanted to bring you some Friday musical relief from all of the COVID-19 and Muskrat Falls news. Musicians from the Irish Descendants and Rum Ragged were getting together to tour the province, but just a couple of hours ago, they've had to cancel that tour. Nonetheless, the music that this combo band, I guess we call them the Ragged Descendants if you mix them all, their music is just too good to miss. So we caught up with them at O'Reilly's Pub during a rehearsal. Well, it's called the Feast of St. Patrick. Uh, my, myself and the Irish descendants, along with a couple of the lads from Rum Ragged, have teamed up to uh, do a provincial tour, mostly arts and cultural centres. Takes us across the island and up to uh, the big land in Labrador, and uh, bringing a little bit of St. Patrick to the rest of the province. In the town of Valley Bay was a lassie dweller that I knew her very well, and the stories were to tell. Father kept her still, and he was a good distiller, oh, but she took the drinks, so the devil would do better. But they ring a ding a da, ring a ding a daddy oh, ring a ding a da, they back from the daddy oh. But she had a wooden leg that was hollow down the middle. She used to tie a string and didn't play it like a fiddle. Fiddle in the house, she fiddled in the alley, but she didn't give a damn. She had to fiddle anyway, she said she couldn't dance. But she had her wellies up, but she had it on. She danced as well as anyone. Wouldn't go to bed unless she had her shimmy up, but she had it on. She couldn't go to bed with any ring a ding a da, ring a ding a daddy oh, ring a ding a da. We whack from the daddy oh, ring a ding a da, ring a ding a daddy oh, ring a ding a da. We whack from the daddy oh. I'd have to say it's going to be a good time, it's going to be a good show, come out. Uh, we got a ton of different types of Irish music in there and Newfoundland songs as well. But uh, it's, uh, it's fun and upbeat, like you know, the stuff we got here in the background. But we also got some lovely ballads and uh, it's a really nice all ages kind of a show and uh, I think you should come out. In the town of Valley Bay, was a messy dweller and the knew her very well, and the stories were to tell. Father kept the still, and he was a good distiller. But when she took the drink, said the devil would have fell over. We ring a ding a da, ring a ding a daddy oh, ring a ding a da. Whack from the daddy oh, ring a ding a da, ring a ding a daddy oh, ring a ding a da. We whack from the daddy oh, ring a ding a da, ring a ding a daddy oh, ring a ding a da. We whack from the daddy oh. Now, as I mentioned, unfortunately, they had to cancel that tour. It was supposed to start tonight, right after here and now, but they're hoping to pull those shows off right across the island and into Labrador, and they're hoping to do that in May month.
The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. All right, Ashley, you already mentioned some of the messy stuff we're going to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Looking a little farther down towards the end of the weekend, uh, how yeah. do things look after the ugly stuff? Well, uh, it's going to quiet down, <laughs> okay. but cool down as well. All so right. we are still looking at the chance of flurries. Let's take a look at the future tracker. I kept those winds on there for you because it's going to stay breezy, certainly uh, overnight, uh, Saturday into Sunday. And that's really going to continue as we head through the day as well. So this takes us through the morning. You see widespread gusts between uh, 40 to as much as 60 kilometers per hour along coastal Labrador. I'm anticipating that those winter storm warnings are going to continue for you through uh, Sunday as well, just because we start to get that onshore flow and those winds are going to stay strong combined with some of that snow. Areas could see uh, upwards of 35 or more centimeters by the time uh, Sunday is uh, said and done along the coast, even uh, certainly in the mountain areas uh, along the southeast coast as well. Now into Sunday morning, we'll start to see that potential for flurries again, onshore flurries and light snow along the west coast combined with some of those uh, heavier winds, we could see some blowing snow through the day. Eventually those flurries will make their way across the island uh, into the afternoon, certainly into the evening hours as we head towards uh, eastern Newfoundland and then clearing skies in behind that. But you can see those winds are going to stay strong pretty much for all of us uh, through the day on Sunday. So temperature wise uh, dipping back down to the minus double digits for Lab City or to the minus double digits minus five for Happy Valley Goose Bay straight sitting in the minus single digits again and then dropping back below zero for the island hovering near or just below zero as our daytime highs. We'll probably see a few peaks of sun in the mix as well, but uh, overall we are looking at that risk of flurries through the day. St. Anthony, you're looking at about minus two. So into Monday, a ridge of high pressure starts to dominate. Things will stay nice and clear up through Labrador. Also for parts of the island, it should be a pretty quiet uh, Monday, even into Tuesday morning, it looks like. Then the next one will move in for Labrador. We'll see that potential for some flurries. Tuesday stays quiet for the most part for the island as well. We'll see the potential for some flurries move in late day and then Wednesday is when uh, that system will move in. At this point, looks like another warm up bringing the potential for some snow and then transitioning to rain as well. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise roller coaster as we've been seeing uh, six degrees tomorrow and then dipping back down well below zero and then back up again for Wednesday as that next system rolls in. But uh, overall the weekends looking uh, or at least Sundays looking like uh, some flurries for central Newfoundland. This is where you'll be sitting. Note that temperature Monday night minus 22. That's because of that ridge of high pressure. Then jumping right back up on Tuesday to about minus two for western Newfoundland. You're looking at uh, sunshine to start off the weekend and then that mix will move in for Wednesday temperatures above zero by then. And then for eastern Labrador uh, hovering just below zero for the most part overnight lows up and down as we head into the beginning of next week. And then for Western Labrador, you're looking at temperatures uh, dipping again Sunday night and then hovering around minus 20 to uh, round out the weekend. Well, I had to share this one. Mm -hmm. It's like cotton candy skies. That's what I call them. Beautiful shot there. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
time to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays. Happy 92nd birthday to Mary Ann Graham in Cornerbrook. She celebrated on Tuesday, and you see her there after she started a snowball fight with her great-grandchildren. And happy 96th birthday to Rachel Bartlett, formerly of Coombs Cove, now in Harbor Breton. Happy 94th birthday last Sunday the 7th to Major Ray Stratton. Happy 90th birthday to Piney Small in Wild Cove, originally from Indian Islands. Maud Tremblett in Bonavista turned 90 last Sunday. And a happy 60th anniversary this coming Monday to Michael and May Best in Porta Basque. Happy 91st birthday last Sunday to Elizabeth Hodder in Clarenville. Happy 90th birthday yesterday to Josephine Whalen of Cape Broil, now living in Whitless Bay. And happy anniversary to Garfield and Lily Bessie of Happy Valley Goose Bay, who celebrated their 56th yesterday. Happy anniversary to Ira and Golda Rogers of Twillingate. They are celebrating their 59th anniversary on Sunday. And happy 60th anniversary on St. Patrick's Day to Patrick and Francis Pearson in Jerseyside. Happy 90th birthday tomorrow to Roy Mercer in Springdale. Happy 90th birthday to Bill Abraham in St. John's who celebrated yesterday. And a happy 98th birthday today to Millie Johnson from Little Catalina. Best wishes to majors Rachel and Sydney Brace from CBS who celebrated 62 years of marriage yesterday. And happy birthday to Pierce Penny who celebrated his 92nd birthday on Tuesday, originally from Great Bra on the Northern Peninsula, now living in St. John's. Happy 97th birthday to Olive Pope in Grand Bank. Her big day is tomorrow. And a happy 90th birthday to Chesley Guy, who resides in Lewisport. Happy 92nd birthday to Wallace Vardy from Grand Falls, Windsor, who celebrated Monday, March 9th. Uh, happy 93rd birthday to Captain Caleb Keene, Skipper Key, formerly of Pound Cove, Bonavista Bay, but now residing in St. John's since 1952. 63rd wedding anniversary greetings for Newman and Shirley Hicks in Stephenville. Birthday greetings to Leah Talk, who is 91 today. Leah is formerly from Ladle Cove, but lives in Gander. And Jerry and Clara Burke of St. Mary celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Happy birthday to Patrick Breen in St. Mary's, who celebrates his 90th birthday tomorrow. And a happy 91st birthday to Bramwell Clark in Lewisport. Happy birthday, the 91st birthday, two days ago to Jean Shea, formerly of Bishop's Falls, now living in Stephenville. And happy birthday greetings to Mary Sheila Flynn in Clark's Beach. She turned 102 yesterday. Congratulations. And there you go. I assumed this was on the island. Yeah, but, I but now it's not. I think I'm wrong, right? You're very wrong. Okay. It's actually taken in Rigolette. You say you're very wrong with a certain delight <laughs> in your voice. Yeah. A lot of other people. Uh, early morning Rigolette sunrise. Len Bennett sent us this great shot. I, again, call them my cotton candy skies. I like Love that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Okay, so we're going to get a little retro here. Uh, given the seriousness of all the cancellations using the latest technology, I'll bring you some uh, a recap of the impact of the coronavirus uh, here in Newfoundland Labrador. A lot of cancellations, so here's just some of them to close our show out uh, tonight. Uh, all recreational centers in St. John's, Mount Pearl Paradise, closing mile one, closing tonight until further notice. Uh, the all jury trails at St. John's courts, uh, trials rather, uh, they have been postponed. Uh, the big home show by the uh, Home Builders Association, a major event for the end of the month, that's being postponed. Uh, the Winter Carnival in Happy Valley Goose Bay, that's been called down, as is the major festival uh, put off by the uh, Rigolette Inuit uh, Community Government. Just our picture from Rigolette. Mm -hmm. Arts and Culture Centers, told you the concert's closed, so there's lots and lots. Uh, you can check out our website for uh, the latest because I suspect it's going to be a very, very busy weekend, so stay tuned to CBC Radio throughout the weekend and go to our website, cbc.ca slash NL, for the very latest on this as uh, there will likely be developments over the weekend and I should mention I'm not going to be here early next week. Carolyn Stokes will be with you which mm -hmm. is great. I'm supposed to be hosting The Current on CBC Radio so hope you can give that a listen in the morning but of course uh, who knows if the planes will be going to Toronto so I might be here. I might or not, you might be, not here. be here. You never know but uh, Play it by it's, been, it's quite a week. It has been. Right. Busy um, week. Thank you so much for uh, watching and uh, we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. Good night.